What's up guys? Welcome to part four of the advanced mechanics series. Today we're covering undercharging. Now this mechanic is a lot easier to understand but probably a lot harder to pull off than some of the, the other mechanics and has a pretty big downside. It's a very high risk, high reward play. Um, but before I get too far into undercharging, first uh, I'd like to take 30 seconds to announce that by popular demand uh, for coaching and theory crafting, team building services, uh, I have decided to open up a Patreon account. So uh, I'll put that in the description if you would, are interested in any of those. Uh, if you'd just like to support me, I'd really appreciate that as well, obviously. And if not, then that's completely fine too. I'm just glad you're watching these videos and trying to better yourself, push the limits of Pokemon Go PvP. Uh, I'll also put a link to the brand new Discord that I've created in the com or the description as well. Um, if you just want to check that out, it's a lot easier for me to answer direct questions there than it is for me to, to scroll through YouTube comments uh, and answer questions in, in that format. Um, so as with the other videos, before we get into what is behind undercharging, uh, I'm just going to first show an example of how it can be used for your benefit and why it is such a big deal. Um, so this first video here, we're going to see on the right, it's a Metagross versus Metagross mirror matchup in the lead. Um, in this case, we are both going to get to an earthquake and my Metagross only has 13 attack IVs. So it turns out we are going to end up in a CMP tie. My Metagross loses CMP ties a lot. So I'm going to shield here. Um, but because I'm already locked into this earthquake, we're going to see my Earthquake goes through. I don't want this Earthquake to fully KO their Metagross. I've slowed down this video. You're going to see me hit some of these bubbles. I'm going to get to a nice. I'm going to hit a great, and I'm just going to stop. So what I'm doing here is making sure my Earthquake doesn't do full damage and therefore KO their Metagross. This is going to leave their Metagross with just a little bit of HP. I know they can't get to another charge move anyways. I'm going to farm down and get four um, bullet punches off. If I was a bit better, I would have been able to get even more. So as you see as this match plays out, um, I just I just have this speeding on. Those four bullet punches worth of energy can definitely make a ton of difference. Um, in this match, I'm not sure if it did. It is really close. It came down to the to the fourth bullet punch because I'm able to get that farm down. And you're going to see I have a Rhyperior and a Metagross versus this Garchomp. Uh, neither of these are very favorable matchups. But with the energy lead that my Metagross has built up... Um, it is a lot in a lot better of a scenario. So because my earthquake didn't KO the Metagross at the beginning of the, the match, I now have four bullet punches of energy to work with. And that was just something to be safe. For example, if their Metagross had shielded, I burn a shield. The undercharge doesn't mean anything, but it's just, if they don't let that, uh, if they don't shield that earthquake, I'm now in a much more favorable position than I would have been in. I'm kind of salvaging a bad position because of my uh, CMP tie earlier where it locked me into that earthquake. So you're gonna see I'm gonna get that meteor mash off and finish off their Garchomp for the win. So before we get into undercharging, this is actually pretty interesting. Get into the charge move mini game basics. When I talk about charge move mini games, I'm talking about the bubbles that come up when, whenever you press a charge move. Um, so when a charge move is activated, uh, you have this mini game, it's different for every type. Uh, it's actually vastly different for every type uh, and the performance your performance in this mini game how many bubbles you hit Directly is correlated to how much damage your move will do now depending on the type of your move It can have anywhere from 23 to 37 bubbles that you have to hit and um, and Each bubble will contribute to the damage. So Thanks to dr. Bill uh, reddit user dr. Bill for doing this research over a year ago now. Uh, there's not very much information regarding this and below is a graph that he's actually done I've annotated a little bit here um, and we're gonna see this is for a 32 bubble move so something like uh, an ice move or a rock move uh, and you can see that if you don't hit any bubbles your move does 25% of the damage of the max damage whereas if you hit all of the bubbles you're gonna do 100% of the damage and each bubble along the way is a different percentage increase of your moves damage um, unfortunately, I'm not sure why this is programmed like this, uh, if Niantic could explain that would be great, but it is not linear because, uh, it seems that these damage ranges are capped or are locked in at the nice, great, and excellent ranges. Um, this is my personal hypothesis and it fits within the error bars and kind of explains 
the lack of linearity. So this is probably the, the most important part of this first page is that a nice will be approximately 50% of the moves damage, a great will be approximately 75% of the moves damage, and an excellent will be 100% of the moves damage. That's right, if you miss a move, that's fine. You can still get the excellent and 100% of the damage for most of them. Um, so as you can see, the number of bubbles to hit a nice is 10, but then you need 13 additional bubbles to hit a great. And then only eight additional bubbles after that to hit an excellent. So uh, that's why you see it's not linear. It, it kind of starts uh, steeper, shallows out because there's more moves and then gets steeper again. So unfortunately, I can't provide you with an exact percentage number uh, that each bubble will give you. So here's a chart that I've compiled. I, uh, I'll just play some, just some of the, uh, the mini game animations on the side so you can kind of compare what's going on. Uh, this is a chart I've compiled. This actually took me a long time to do. I slowed down every animation, counted all the bubbles. Um, please let me know if I'm wrong. One person doing this and testing how many you're allowed to miss before you get an excellent. Uh, it, the margin for error is very, very slim. Uh, what's important to notice here, this number allowed to miss and get excellent, you're looking at fighting, flying, and grass type moves. They all have 23 bubbles. And if you miss a single bubble, you're not getting excellent, so you're not getting full damage on the move. Whereas every single other uh, move, even ghost with just 25 or steel with just 24, if you're allowed to miss one bubble and still maintain that full damage. So if you really do want to get into the thick of it, I honestly personally think when undercharging, it's it's best to use nice, great, and excellent as your benchmarks and kind of move up and down by gut feel about that. But if you really do want to get into it, uh, this column here, this approximate percent damage per bubble is the amount of additional damage that you're going to be dealing with each bubble you hit. Uh, so if you do really need, if you think you're going to see a specific matchup a ton, like for example, uh, my first example, the Metagross Metagross matchup, that's something you might see in the lead a lot. You can actually do the calculations and see how many bubbles of that ground move you need to hit. But I think that might be a little bit overkill um, when it comes to that overcharging in a way is probably more of an art than a science. These are the numbers behind it. But in reality, you're going to be using your gut feel a lot more than um, actually calculating it out. So let's talk about undercharging. Sorry, I think I mentioned overcharging earlier. I meant undercharging. If you ever hear me say overcharging in this video, I mean undercharging. So what is undercharging? Like we saw earlier, that is not hitting all of the bubbles to intentionally deal less than your full damage. Um, this has multiple applications. So the reason you should undercharge is mainly for health and energy management. Either you're trying to gain a health advantage over normal play, or you're trying to gain an energy advantage over normal play. And normally this is done when the enemy Pokemon or your Pokemon is not threatened by theirs, or it can be used to salvage poor situations. So the two situations, and, and I'm gonna stress that you should really only be undercharging in these two situations. I see a lot of players undercharge sometimes for no reason and, uh, and lose games. I've probably seen more players lose games from undercharging than win games from undercharging. So really be careful. Um, the only two scenarios you should undercharge are number one, when you're in a dominating matchup and you want to leave the matchup with a hundred energy. So in other cases, or another way of saying this is if you were going to farm them down and your farm down would take you much over 100 energy, then that is when one time to undercharge, uh, this can be used to optimize your health or energy. And I'll show an example of both of those. And then number two, this is the example we saw at the very beginning uh, when you unfortunately CMP tie and this is when you can salvage energy out of a bad situation. So for example, I CMP tie with my Metagross. I don't want to go into the next matchup with no energy. I want to go into the next matchup with a little bit of energy. I'll undercharge so I can farm down in a safe situation. You don't want to undercharge and then take another charge move later. That doesn't really make any sense. You're going to be kicking yourself for it later. It happens all the time. So, now we're gonna to go to undercharging in a dominating matchup. Um, I'm just gonna pull up this video really quick. So the first one we're gonna look at is, we're gonna look at conservation of health. So being able to conserve some of the health 
that you would otherwise lose. Now we're going to take a look at a decently common matchup. This is Bastion versus Skarmory. And in, in this situation, this Skarmory is just throwing sky attacks. And we're going to see what happens when the Bastion farms the Skarmory all the way down. Um, as you can see, it's a very comfortable matchup for Bastion, regardless of the amount of charge moves taken. And, and you can see here's the health. We're looking at approximately, let's say, 30% health. Between 25 and 30. So in this case, I'm going to throw a stone edge. I know flamethrower is the better move, but I'm going to undercharge it here. So my goal is to deal only a little bit of damage. I get to that nice there. That's my benchmark. And I want to leave that Skarmory with enough health that when I finish attacking all the way down, I end up with 100 energy regardless. So we're going to see how this goes. Speed it back up because nobody has time for to watch the, the whole thing. Um, but you can see already I'm in a much healthier position than before. I'm going to end this matchup with nearly 45% health, right? So what the, what is happening here is because I undercharge correctly, my Bastion ends this matchup with 15% extra health. This could be a big deal just in case they have another flyer on their team um, that I would have to pivot around and bring the Bastion back in. 45% health Bastion can very comfortably be comfortably beat an Altaria, but it may not be able to comfortably beat it with 30% health. You might need to uh, make sure that Altaria doesn't have energy or anything like that. Um, the second reason to undercharge would be to kind of conserve um, energy. So I'm going to pull up another uh, technically dominating matchup here. So we're going to see uh, Altaria versus Victory Bell, but we're both going to swap right away. Um, and it's going to be Vigoroth locked in against Galarian Stunfisk. So this first example um, is going to show what happens when you just counter all the way down. I'm throwing a Body Slime here, but it's going to be shielded uh, just to show the, the amount of health and the amount of damage. Uh, what happens if you counter all the way down in the Galarian Stunfisk versus Vigoroth matchup. So I want to exit this with... 100 energy and I hit the 100 energy mark there even though I threw a body slam and they get to another earthquake and even though I spent two shields uh, I'm in big trouble I want to end with a ton of energy because these body slams will really hurt the shadow victory bell when it comes in later so in this case I'm going to show the baseline when I throw a body slam and they don't shield so I'm going to throw the body slam they don't shield and I'm going to continue countering all the way down notice that um I do end up with a lot of energy, but, and they don't get that earthquake off, but I'm still not, you see my bump up in energy there. I still wasn't quite at a hundred energy. So we kind of want something in between both of those things. This is what I'm talking about with conservation of energy. Uh, I want to be able to survive, but I also want to exit this matchup with a hundred energy. So in this case, you're going to watch me undercharge this. I get to a nice and I'm just going to stop a little bit right, right after that nice in this case. It's not always after nice. These two examples just happen to be nice. And we're going to watch this counter down. I have to shield that uh, second earthquake again. Uh, but after this counter down, you're going to see I'm at that 100 energy. I'm going to attack again. And the energy bar does not move up. Just showing that I remain at 100 energy. So that's just one example of how undercharging can conserve energy. The other thing about uh, advantage about undercharging versus the full farm down is that you also have the opportunity to bait a shield. So in that first example, they shielded. Um, if that happens, I would be able to throw another body slam and undercharge that. Uh, because I charge up to a bulldoze first, they're scared that I'm just straight going for the KO instead of the farm down, they might bait a shield. So in a case where you're in a dominating matchup and you can farm that much, even in the first one, Bastion versus Skarmory, someone might shield the Skarmory. There is a chance that someone might actually shield it out there. They think their Skarmory is that vital to their game plan. Um, and it's always just that little chance at a shield uh, is always better than nothing. So we're going to take a look at the other application of undercharging here. And this is undercharging in a CMP tie. So you already saw the first example with the Metagross. Uh, and the CMP tie. I'm just going to show another example. It's they're all they're all very similar. They're mostly when you get roped into a bad situation and you're trying to 
and get the last little bit out of it. It can always lead to a win. Sometimes it doesn't, but you're going to see Shadow Victory Bell locked in to Alola Marowak. We're just going to throw our moves here. And this Alola Marowak, uh, I'm going to swap into Bastion and Stone Edge right away. But due to a CMP tie, he gets Bone Club off first. At this point, I do not want to KO this Alola Marowak. I just want to do a little damage so I can get some of that energy back and bring that into the next matchup, whether it be Bastion or whatever other Pokemon comes in. So the Stone Edge only deals a little bit of damage, and I am able to farm down, get three extra Smackdowns, so half a Stone Edge just from undercharging there. So now we're going to talk about the dangers of undercharging. This is actually very important as well. I see a lot of players just try and undercharge kind of for fun. Like I'll see sometimes they'll, I know they're not at 100 energy and they're just throwing moves that deal less damage than I know they should. That is because players are attempting to undercharge in a situation where it is always better if you're not at 100 energy to kind of farm up to when they would get to their charge move and then throw your charge move. Um, if you undercharge, you run that risk of undercharging incorrectly and losing the matchup. I'm just going to show an example of that. So this is yet another Vigoroth matchup, Vigoroth versus Whiskash. Um, the Vigoroth versus Whiskash matchup in the Zero Shield is Vigoroth favored. You win the, the CMP ties. Um, but while this is rolling, this is just the baseline. So this is just to show Vigoroth beats Whiskash. Um, I don't actually have the example of where you, oh shoot, this is actually the first time I actually mean to say overcharge, um, where you count their fast move to see when they get to that next mud bomb. Um, but this example will be the example of a failed undercharge, kind of undercharging when you really don't have to. So I'm gonna throw body slams here. And once again, we're gonna run the no shield situation. Uh, they're gonna get to another mud bomb. And this time, instead of fully charging this body slam, I'm going to undercharge it a little bit. And while I'm trying to get counter down and get that extra energy, the Whiskash can get an extra Mud Bomb off and either have to shield or let my Vigoroth go down. Uh, this can honestly be very game losing. I've seen it happen a lot. Actually, even in my sets earlier today, I failed an undercharge, although it was due to a CMP tie, so you should feel less bad about those. But you should really tr not be undercharging when you don't have to. If you're not at 100 energy, or 95 energy or something like that, or you're not locked into a CMP tie, just don't undercharge. Um, that's my, I guess, my public service announcement right there. Uh, but yeah, as always, if you have any questions, I would say leave them in the comments, but uh, I would prefer if you join the Discord server in the description instead. Um, and let me know if you like this format better. I tried to, I got some feedback about maybe sticking away from the PowerPoints a bit. Undercharging was a bit more of a uh, understandable concept where I feel like people probably aren't going to have to pause on the PowerPoint to, to read a chart as much. Um, so I felt like it, it did work better here, but let me know if you liked more of a uh, clip focused uh, advanced mechanics video instead. And if you have any other suggestions for mechanics that you'd like covered, also let me know. And as always, thanks for watching.